Good afternoon and welcome to all of our visitors to the Yash Technologies webinar today where we are going to focus on what sometimes may not be the most uh, awe-inspiring topic, but definitely in today's time, support is at the forefront of everybody's mind and, and support when it's working well. That's why it's not one of the most awe-inspiring topics because when we're doing it right, it, it, it keeps the lights on, everybody's happy, and, and it works very, very well. But in today's world, we know it's anything but that. Challenges have been thrown at all of our panelists, our, our Yash Technologies team members, and we've had to evolve at a very quick and, and rapid pace. The value in today's webinar is to share insights and thought leadership from, from a great group of, of, of business executives and my colleague Raj Maravada from Yash Technologies. What we'll cover off on today are three main topics. And obviously we'll start the show with how, what's been the impact of, of the pandemic and the business disruption over the past five months or so. Seems like a lot longer than that, I know, but it has been basically five months that, that we've been dealing with this. And, and we'll, we'll make that specific to the area of support and, and obviously and how, we, how will we overcome that as a group and what changes have we made. Then we'll transition quickly into the topic of what does a partner mean in today's, today's business climate? What values do you place on partnership and perhaps how has that changed as a result of the past five or six months? And then why there's value in staying until the very end today our last topic, it's the home run. It's the future ready state of support. What, what do our panelists see the future being for support as a result of what we've all faced? And then Raj will, will add in some of the secret sauce that, that Yash has been developing in the background since, since, since this all kicked off in, in March of that time frame, And we have some really exciting announcements and some really exciting next steps to share with you from Yash Technologies' specific point of, of view. So I'm glad that you've joined us. I ask you to stay for the entire duration of the webinar because during our preparation, I've gotten to know all of these panelists very well. They're ready to roll. They've got great things to share. And as always, my colleague Raj, he's the guru of all things support. He, he'll come in and, and add some really insightful notes. And, and like I said, he'll tie things up with next steps. Uh, without further ado, I'll introduce myself. I'm John Gretter. I'm vice president, one of the vice presidents with Yash Technologies. I have a very specific, when I'm not doing webinar moderation, a very specific focus on our SAP service line, our go-to-market activities, and our overall alliance with SAP. So I'll, I'll throw that shameless plug out there to all of my, my SAP colleagues that may be joining us today. Thank you for, for tuning in to the Yash Technologies webinar. I am gonna turn it over though and allow the rest of my panelist colleagues to introduce themselves. Fred, if I could, please, and I, I got to give Fred a lot of credit. Fred is actually joining today's webinar while he's on vacation. That's how <laughs> dedicated he is. He is on vacation and carved out an hour for us today. So, Fred, without further ado, please introduce yourself to our audience. Well, good afternoon. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Fred McClintock, and I'm the VP of IT at U.S. Tobacco Cooperative in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, and Again, thanks again for joining us this afternoon. Um, I've spent the last 20 years of my career in leadership roles in various companies and different industries. Uh, some using internal resources to support and manage and enhance applications while others using uh, a full AMS model and actually most of them using the hybrid model of, of, of both. Uh, and in my current role uh, as the head of IT for an organization that implemented SAP S4HANA uh, a little over two years ago in the summer of 18, uh, we're using a third-party AMS to provide all of our functional and technical support for our SAP landscape, uh, mostly due to the size of our organization. We're, we're, we're falling into that mid-size category, um, but also the resource requirements of our, of our environment. Um, so anyway, welcome, and I look forward to sharing my experiences with you all today, and uh, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Fred, thank you very much. Anu, Lakar Raju, I will move to you and please introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, everyone. I am uh, Anu Lakar Raju. I am uh, the director of uh, IT applications and uh, digital solutions at uh, uh, Materian um, Incorporated, um, which is um, an advanced materials uh, manufacturing company um, headquartered in um, uh, 
Cleveland, um, Ohio is where our cor corporate headquarters are. Um, I have uh, 20 plus years of uh, IT um, experience, most of it in the ERP space, um, uh, project management, various capacities, leadership roles, and um, a large part of uh, that experience has been uh, spent in uh, uh, leveraging an EMS uh, provider um, and partner, uh, not only at the company I'm at right now, but also in uh, uh, in, 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 in previous uh, companies that I worked at. So um, I'm really excited to um, hear um, insights from uh, other panelists and also share my tips and tricks on how we are managing, leveraging the relationship we have with uh, our current AMS partners um, uh, during the pandemic. So really excited for the discussion. Thanks, Anu. Chuck, over to you, please, sir. Hi, I'm Chuck McMinn. I'm Director of Business Process and Applications at National Gypsum. Um, I manage the, the IT application space for National Gypsum. Uh, National Gypsum is a, one of the largest producer of gypsum board, drywall. Uh, we, we operate plants uh, throughout the US and Canada producing our, our gypsum board products, our cement board, our interior finishing product. Uh, we're, we're also uh, vertically integrated in terms of we mine our own rock and wow. uh, produce our own paper to make our, our, our finishing products. Um, we, I joined National Gypsum about three years ago. We were, the National Gypsum as a company was in process of implementing SAP. Uh, most of my career, 20 plus years in SAP, I was hired to kind of come in and define that new IT organization kind of moving forward. Uh, at National Gypsum, we were going from a mainframe shop, implementing SAP and evolving into an SAP-centered shop. So what I, I defined, the, that, that organization kind of moving forward. And uh, AM, we have a hybrid approach, as Fred was saying, um, and a trusted AMS partner was an important part of our strategy as well, to kind of complement an in-house team with a, with a partner as well. I'm glad to be here. I'm not at a fun vacation location like Fred, but I actually <laughs> returned to the office. <laughs> so I was happy to get out of my house today. <laughs> yeah. Chuck, thanks for joining us, and we'll, we'll look forward to hearing more insights from you over the next 45 to 50 minutes or so. Last and certainly not least of the panelists, we'll get to you, Raj, after, after Mr. Hapner introduces himself to our audience today. All right, thanks. I'm Dave Hapner. I'm uh, with Deer Hitachi Construction Equipment. Um, I started in February. They actually hired me to do an S4HANA implementation. Uh, they're currently on ECC6, EHP7. Um, I've been doing SAP for the last 20 years, both from a project management uh, perspective and from an AMS perspective. So uh, as far as the virus goes and the economic downturn that we've been in, uh, it's driven my peers and I to ask some real basic questions. You know, what, you know, what is our core business do? And then what is core competency inside of the IT context? And then the second one was, what have we learned from COVID-19? And really interesting, I'll give you this really quick and we'll talk about it more. The, um, what we found was that our demand in the AMS realm has gone down in the infrastructure and it's actually gone down on what I'd call the standard SAP suite, but it's actually gone up significantly directly related to our business core functions, designing and building world-class excavators. So it's really interesting what uh, response that's driven us to. So I'd like to share that with you today. And Dave, I'll look forward to diving deeper into that in just a few minutes. So that, that'll be great for that first topic of how the, the pandemic and the business disruption has really affected AMS as a whole uh, within your organization. So what you just heard Dave share right there from an audience perspective, keep that top of mind. We'll be going right back to him and the rest of the panelists to do a little bit of a deeper dive over what the, the impacts of, of the pandemic and, and the greater business disruption as a result have had on their, their organizations. But I, I, would, I would be remiss if I do not pause and let my colleague Raj Maravada introduce himself as I set up with Fred. Fred's on vacation, Raj is in India. So for any of you that have any kind of a scale of time zones, 
Raj has been <laughs> gulping down coffee for the last couple hours so he can stay awake and stay engaged with us during today's webinar. So Fred gave up vacation. Raj is giving up sleep. I don't know. I don't know which one has it has it worse at this point in time. But Raj, <laughs> please introduce yourself to the audience and promise me you'll stay awake and engaged with me for the next hour or so. Absolutely, John. Thank you very much. And welcome to everyone um, to this webinar. And thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, this is Raj here. Um, I am AVP Application Services at Yash Technologies. I had the AMS practice, I've been with Yash for a decade plus now, and I'm into the IT services for about 23, 24 years now. And majority of my career is around program delivery, customer service, and, and obviously into AMS space. So I have a lot to share and I'm really excited to know your views as well. Thank you. Great. Raj, thank you very much. And to all of our, our visitors on the webinar today, because this is structured as a, as a pure roundtable discussion, we're not going to take a specific pause for Q&A at the end of, of our time together. The, the webinar will unfold as the discussion does very organically, and, and we'll, we'll have just envision, like I said, a roundtable discussion where we're all talking, albeit virtually. If you do have a question or if you have a comment, there is a chat function built into the, the platform, the GoToWebinar platform, where you can click chat and you can type in your question or your comment. And the, the Yash team that is, is working behind the scenes to make sure that, that everything stays up and running well will capture that question and do their best to get it to us and, and we'll fit it into the conversation where where it belongs if there are questions that you have uh, that don't make it into the overall discussion today uh, again put it into that chat we'll grab it and we'll reach out to you after the webinar and get you that that information or those next steps that, that you've asked for let's jump into it though that's why everybody's here is, is to hear the great dialogue and and the thought leadership that the panelists are, are able to lend and, and fred when we were preparing for today's webinar we talked about this first topic quite quite a bit and that's the impact that the pandemic and the business disruption have had on on all of your organizations and specifically dave started down the path of at, at dear hitachi what what some of those impacts have been for for his organization i know you had shared some really interesting insights as to what you've been dealing with and, and some of those impacts so let's first talk about what the, the impact has been. We'll open that up to the general discussion. And then right after this, I, I'm interested to see how you've all dealt with those impacts. So let's start with the impact and then we'll go into the remedies that you found to deal with those. Fred, please, please share what you shared with us a couple of days ago in preparation. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so it's, it's like all of you, it's been an interesting uh, five or six months. Um, you know, our business is really broken into two main uh, functions. One is our consumer products business where we manufacture and market and sell cigarettes out to uh, the U.S. market with our own domestic brands, but also an international side as well. And then our leaf business, which is, you know, buying and processing tobacco for cigarette manufacturers around the world, uh, including our own. Uh, the cigarette component, the, the consumer products part of our business has stayed actually fairly steady. Um, we're considered a part of the critical supply chain for the convenience store business um, and we actually own and operate um, some distribution companies and consumer products business out for wholesale distribution um, as part of our portfolio and those businesses have done very well. In fact, some of them have done you know better than expected. Uh, the flip side of that is our leaf business. So our leaf business, which is the business where we buy our uh, the flu cured tobacco from our, our growers here in the southeast U.S. We, we process that tobacco and sell it to the cigarette uh, companies. Uh, you know, our biggest customer is China. Um, so we've actually been disrupted with our Chinese relationships for three years now, for three seasons. So um, it's been very difficult. This year is very much a, a, a repeat of the last two seasons from a tobacco standpoint because we've not had a great uh, trade relationship on that market. Um, having said all that, from a from a an AMS standpoint, from an IT standpoint, from a support standpoint, um, you know, we've taken a since I got there a little over four years ago, we've taken an approach of you know really being good stewards of 
business process of the, the spend in the company from an IT standpoint or from a technology standpoint. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that we we know and understand the business processes as well as the business does. Um, so we we un, we we try to be embedded and understand what's going on in those environments. Um, we are doing. Uh, we're, yeah, obviously we're keeping the lights on, right? Um, and the and the ticket volume outside of that spike of a first, you know, end of March, early April that everybody went through um, has normalized. It's come back to kind of a flat, um, steady state. Um, but we've always taken the approach of, you know, looking at things from a priority standpoint, whether it's compliance or a customer requirement versus a productivity improvement that's going to help achieve goals within the company. Um, and so we've, that methodology and that, that thought process has carried forward from when things were great, right? Um, and so those things, I, I, I've kind of felt like those things kind of transcend uh, all the experiences of my career. Those things work whether, you know, you feast or famine, right? Um, and you, you, you just a question of where the bar is, but you, you, once you know where the bar is, then you can, then you can adjust accordingly. But the, but the way we adjust is always the same. So it's, it's worked out pretty well because it wasn't a new thought process to go through as these situations arose over the last couple of years, sure. and especially in the last five months. Um, you know, we're still doing enhancement work. Um, it's much more focused on things that are going to really satisfy a customer or drive productivity improvements. It's not, you know, we're, we rarely, rarely dip our toe into the nice to have enhancements, but frankly, you rarely dip your toe into those things anyway. Right. Um, there's so much other work that needs to be done um, that that a lot of times you don't get to those anyway. So that's kind of been our experience. Um, you know, like I said, once we got over that bubble of getting everybody remote and getting everybody set up and making sure all that stuff works, um, you know, we were very fortunate. We were very cloud based at the beginning of the year. We were in the middle of a team's implementation when all of this happened. So we've kind of escalated and 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 sped up the implementation of that project, um, fortunately, uh, and that's worked out well for us. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of the story at U.S. Tobacco. I'm 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 curious to hear how others have have uh, managed over the same five or six. I guess we're coming up on six months now, aren't we? Yeah, it's uh, unbelievable. There. Unbelievable. I thought it was only supposed to be two weeks. Um, so. <laughs> So Fred, we'll come back to you in just a few moments here to get some of those insights when you when you talk about coming down off of that initial spike and then you, you mentioned you had that Teams implementation too. Some of those insights of how you've managed all of that and, and whatever you can attribute other than the, the natural proclivity of, of the, the peaks and valleys. I'm sure there were some specific things that, that you and your department did that aided in, in the, the descent down the hill in, in the ticket count. So we'll get to that in just a, a few yeah. minutes. I'm going to transition over. Dave, Chuck, or Anu, who'd like to jump in and, and share? Dave, I, I'm actually going to put a pin in you because you stole a little bit and, and jumped ahead in, in the list and, and gave some of your good stuff. So Chuck, Anu, what, what, what type of insights do, do you have to share? I think uh, the pandemic definitely has brought a unique twist to cost cutting and resource allocations. So we are dealing with uh, both cost cutting and resource allocations in a very unique way uh, because we just had to uh, improvise your uh, your traditional uh, you know typical market prediction algorithms used in the past currently are ineffective. It's a, such a unique situation to be in, um, and definitely I think only the most important uh, business critical strategic initiatives um, uh, have budget allocations. Uh, yeah. in our company. Uh, and um, uh, I concur with uh, uh, Fred, uh, the, 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 the ticket queue um, was um, it had that initial spike. Uh, and most of them um, were more to do with um, uh, infrastructure networking type of way. Everybody was trying to, you know, get on the get on the network. So we, we, we had a, a, a few um, pains, but for a very short time. I think the infrastructure team really, really stepped up and uh, and, and we gave a lot of focus on uh, uh, the infrastructure and networking uh, portion and making sure that those tickets uh, were allocated and those uh, issues resolved. Um, I would say we've changed the way we looked at, um, you know, even the capital and expense budget allocations, the way we look at it. 
is very different. Um, and um, as we go forward in the discussion, um, I can share more about that. And Anu, somebody from the infrastructure team definitely is going to owe you a cup of coffee for that nice plug that, that you just gave that, that department. Yeah, you you made some friends. You made from some friends within your organization with that one. Chuck, Dave, anything that either of you would like to, to add until we, until we get into some of the solutions that, that you've brought into these disruptions? Yeah, um, you know, from our side, Really, I, I, I think back and say there's been very little change with the exception we've moved the team to remote very quickly. Our workload has actually increased. We had a big project that had to go forward. So we've moved that project forward as well as we've got our typical AMS, our typical work with the business, just doing it in a complete remote fashion. I think what we did as we moved this project forward is because of that relationship we had with Yash on our AMS side, we went with that trusted partner to say that that's the way we want to move this project forward using those resources, being able to spin up new project resources alongside our AMS to, to bring this project live by the end of the year. So I wish I had more less work right now, but we've got a big project. <laughs> we've got keeping the lights on. Um, we pull back on a lot of enhancements as a company. This is probably one of our main priorities, and uh, there was going to be no stopping regardless. Chuck, I, I kind of, uh, no pun intended here, I kind of chuckled when you when you brought up the fact that you, you're you're working really hard and, and you wish you weren't working quite so hard. I really thought when we did this remote work from home, everybody working remote, that we would see this downtick in, in how busy we are. I mean, I've seen the exact opposite. I'm busier now than I've, I've ever been in, in my career. And I, I mean, look at, we're working Raj well past midnight, for goodness sake. So it's, <laughs> it's across the whole the whole team at Yash Technologies but and by by all of your reaction the smiles and the laughter right there I can tell that you're feeling the same thing we we we're doing the exact opposite we're busier than we ever have been which thankfully that that's a good thing that means business is going forward and we we found a way to adapt to to this situation that's been thrown at us so Dave I'm going to come to you right now thinking of that adaptation and the the evolution of AMS and and, and what you're working on on. You had you had started to, to let out during your introduction some of the challenges that you faced at, with, with Dear Hitachi. Go ahead and move into how you've overcome some of those things. So let's just migrate and let you lead uh, the, the part of our, our second talk track around the impact. What have you done to overcome some of these things? Well, and I may be skipping to the to the third section without meaning to. Uh, Man, by you, the way, you're working me hard here today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, keep you in line. I can tell. By the way, I, I'm the only guy with a tie on. I just want to assure everyone I'm not wearing shorts. Um, <laughs> um, That's a good one. Yeah, I am. <laughs> uh, I knew you were. Um, no, what we did was back up and try to do more of a classic approach and said, okay, this is an opportunity for us. So let's look at what the business go-to-market strategy is. Let's look what the core competencies are for the business. And then recognize that you know what if it in in our business if you're outside of de design engineering or manufacturing you're a support group so uh, you want to basically control control the cost there and optimize what you get out of it efficiencies so on and so forth so what we did was then say okay how can we uh how can we look now at it as a business in a business and say what what do we do from a strategic perspective to make sure that we're clearly defining the work into three categories. And so we would call that clear commodity work, uh, intermediate sort of uh, uh, maintenance and enhancement development work, and then high-end you know, development and consulting. We're a, we're a pure SAP shop. So um, uh, including we run MII, ECTR, we do everything in SAP. Um, and so, uh, as I said before, what we decided was that essentially uh, we're and we're in the process of pulling the trigger on some of this and some of it uh, is still under debate, I'll admit. Uh, but the strategy is driving us to say, OK, where can we outsource um, more of our operations? Where does it make sense? Uh, currently, we're a hybrid cloud uh, company. We do SAP on prem. Uh, you know, what where does it make sense to? 
uh, go cloud because it's just more efficient. Um, and then, you know, I've spent the better part of the last two months just engaging with a series of vendors to um, find who's going to be, or uh, it's maybe multiple vendors, the right partner for us uh, given our situation. You know, so uh, we're we're uh, evaluating on a number of levels, and trying to deal with the impact. Uh, this, our impact is the very same, with one minor exception. I think uh, from the beginning, the Feds declared us. Uh, an essential industry, so right. we never actually shut down at all, and so we've we we are the demand is down, so we've we've reduced our our, our workload in the shifts, but um, you know we we know we've been fighting the opposite thing. How do we how do we keep COVID out, and keep going? Sure, different different set of, of problems, but at the root, it's the same thing driving those yeah. problems by and yeah. large. We we have time for one more before one more view of, of some of the remedies we've had before I, I transition to Raj to get some perspective from Yash Technologies. Fred, you had talked about that that initial spike, and we we've heard that now from several of the panels. There was that initial spike in ticket count but it, it eventually came back down to more manageable level. What were some of the things that you can directly attribute to your team that you did to, to, help, to help ease that spike in, in ticket count? Well, uh, it was, you know, nobody, nobody expected this, right? Um, nobody, nobody planned for a, a pandemic. Um, anybody who says they did is not telling you the truth. Um, <laughs> When or maybe in the fall asking them some questions may and that that might be that might be more what we need to do if they were the ones planning for it i think we found the cause <laughs> right we had um it, so we're in raleigh so in uh, in the fall of 18 we had um back-to-back -back hurricanes um a month apart september and october and it was a very stressful couple weeks um from a from a system standpoint you know from a data center standpoint from a lot of different you know are things going to be up and running in the morning when I wake up? Um, when you think like that, then you don't sleep, right? So we did a lot of work after that time to move move things into more secure environments, more robust env environments. So we were well positioned going into this thing. So um, our spike in March and early April was strictly on the desktop side of things, right? It was about making sure we had enough laptops, which we didn't. Um, you know, and we had to scramble to get laptops. In fact, I gave mine back um, and and came up with another solution. Um, everybody placed an order for a laptop, so there was a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a problem there. Um, you know, sending printers home, getting printers home to people, getting scanners home to people. We have a lot of a lot of our people that were able to go home and work remote are in the finance group and customer service, um, and they had those hardware needs that we weren't ready to satisfy. So. They were very much, I would say, it, it, north of 80% was a desktop support um, challenge. Um, I'm lucky, I've got the best desktop support team ever. So um, they did a great job. We were well positioned to handle it. Um, those That group did a great job over the course of three or four weeks to not only to get the equipment out, but to get people up and running, right? So it, you, know, you get them the equipment, but it, do they know how to use it? Um, so it, it was um, it was it was good that we took it that we paid attention in 2018 to the hurricanes, right? Because that forced us to do a lot of work that took months, if not years, to do, so that we were ready for the next need. We thought it was going to be more hurricanes. We didn't think it was going to be a pandemic. Sure. Um, so you're able to take those best practices, Fred, and apply them to the pandemic. We did, we did, and uh, you know the, the team now that's working remote, and I'm sure my my colleagues would share the same. Although it looks like a lot of them went into the office for this meeting. Um, and, you know, my team loves working from the house. Um, you know, don't if anybody from U.S. Tobacco is listening, I you know don't you can go on, take your headphones off. They don't get the drop-ins, they don't get the drive-bys. You know, they're actually sure. getting they're getting a lot of productivity gains just by being able to concentrate on tickets, but also then just the project work. Um, so uh, I think that was probably a much longer answer than no, it's great. Wanted. But, uh, you know, it, it, it really worked out and it was, 
I've, I've, it's, it's rare you see a team rally the way a team rallied the way it did back in March. And I'm sure, again, I'm sure everybody felt the same thing, but it was, it was kind of exciting to all have a, in hindsight, exciting, not at the time. So we had a, we had a, a common cause, right? And we had a common, you know, we needed, this needed to happen and needed to be a non-event from a technology standpoint. And that was our goal. So. Yeah, that common rallying point that, that everybody could drive towards. Raj, yeah. uh, you know, with, with the time with, with the time we have right here, and I want to transition to our next topic, topic number two, and that's really how how the, the panelists view partnerships and and how the the pandemic has changed that view. But before I go to that topic, Raj, share with the the audience members today from the the Yash Technologies a, a partner standpoint. What have you heard and what have your team heard and some of the value of, of those insights that you can lend to the greater audience today? So what have been some of your takeaways over the last five or six months? Right, John. So, so what lied as a small possibility on our business continuity plans for our customers, it suddenly becomes a reality, pandemic, right? And, and we see that what the future of work is not really in the future. It's actually here right now. It's real, right? And, yes. and that way, remote work has become a reality remote remote work is a new norm and and it kind of erased the borders between you know offshore onshore near shore nothing exists today it's it's just remote working with that said we see certain patterns as trends with the bunch of customers that we are working with today so one of them obviously like like anu and david were saying you know cost obviously is in focus and like david is saying some businesses can never stop isn't it so with that in context, we see that most of the customers are looking at cost optimization, and that's inevitable. Given the current condition, that is inevitable, which is fine. But that, keeping aside, which is obvious, we see that some of the customers asking us to see if we can help them move from you know, managed staffing to managed services, staffing engagements to managed services. Similarly, there are specific things like, can you move me to cloud, which would save them some money. Again, again, given, the, some businesses can't stop and their user experience cannot be disrupted and the business continuity is at the paramount importance they're saying can we have stringent SLAs than what we were looking at there are those requests as well so we have these customers on the spectrum you know ranging from most of them looking for cost optimization to a set of customers who are trying to invest like somebody on the panel was trying to say you know check was saying that there is a new project that we didn't we, we should not stop there is a lot of you know increase in the workload so there are investments that are made into new initiatives as well. But we at Yes, our focus as a service provider trying to serve multiple customers is to you know, take a security first approach, increase our focus on security with the pandemic expanding the network limits to work from home conditions, like, like um, Chuck was saying, desktops, right? No desktops now, everybody wants a laptop, everybody wants to work from home, everybody needs to work from home. So that kind of really tested our limits in terms of how secure these networks need to be in place so that we don't really disturb the IP of our customers, right? And at the same time, how do we enable our employees with necessary infrastructure that is needed so that we can kind of continuously support our customers? At the same time, can we deliver our services in an optimal mode with respect to cost and resources? Anu was pointing on you know, cost as well as the resources, isn't it? And, and then how can we be flexible to customer needs? I would come to the flexibility part a little later in terms of what kind of flexible services we can offer, but flexibility does matter in tough times like this in multiple aspects, not mm -hmm. just resource cost. It's about the way we engage with our customers. At the same time, internally for us as a service provider, employees of paramount importance. So how are we taking care of the well-being of our employees? Because that's the backbone of this entire system that needs to run and help our customers run their business. And at, at the same time, you never know what will happen, that the impact of pandemic at the end of the day, if it hits the employees, how do you keep that additional staff on standby to ensure you know, the business as usual scenario? That's of significant importance to us as a, as a service provider. With all that said, we feel that we are living in an environment that we kind of live you know, as if we are executing a BCP test almost every day. That's the kind of situation that service providers like us are running through. Having said that, I think I noticed one of the panelists also mentioning about some of the positives. I think you know Fred was talking about productivity. I, I, I'm sure the panelists would agree that there is increased productivity. Of course, there is increased workload as well. 
but at the same time we notice there are there are positives too if we really carefully examine the current situation we see that there is increased productivity from all the employees both on the customer side on the service provider side a lot is being accomplished because very less distraction less travel so many factors contributing to it at the same time as a service provider we also see there are reduced attrition rates you know not many people are looking at changing their people are looking at doing focused work serving the company and and make sure things go as usual right at the same time one of the very specific incident that i would like to highlight as a last thing as part of this topic is for one of our customers in the middle east who is into the food processing and manufacturing um, we had to do a remote kt and that's that's becoming a new norm again right everything is remote now how do you do kt and and what's the positive in that we we were a little apprehensive when we started sometime in april but what we realized is that the amount of time that we used to spend the knowledge transition with respect to travel you know the stay of the people going to onshore locations and the the amount of logistics that we need to make sure that are in place all of that is being now spent on acquiring knowledge at an easier pace and much more comprehensively that's a lot of positive that we see coming out of pandemic so very interesting situations interesting scenarios but as a service provider trying to work with multiple customers we have a wide range of experiences great raj thank you so much for that perspective david, and, and I, go ahead david i'm sorry let, let me just insert for those who may not know what kt is uh knowledge transfer in the managed services area when we talk about kt we're talking about managed knowledge transfer from the client to the vendor uh, and, sure. and uh, that's cool that you were able to do all that remote that is not easy to do i know absolutely david thank you thanks no. for that Every, everybody's adapting dave and, and figuring out these things and and I, one of my favorite bits of information that came out i saw an interview with tim cook the apple ceo uh, it was shortly after maybe two months into the pandemic and he made note that from from the information that Apple was privy to, which is obviously quite a bit of information, they were estimating that digital adoption was being escalated by as much as 10 years. That, wow. that, that digital adoption that was going to be 10 years down the road was being brought into the, the current state be, because we're being forced to. Forced to I do mean, it, we'll, yeah. We'll look back at this as obviously a pandemic and we'll, we'll look back at this in the history books as a, as a huge business disruption. But I, I also wonder how we'll look back at this from a, a digital adoption strategy and, and what kind of a kickstart this is going to give to some really incredible, incredible developments and, and some incredible uh, new, new technologies that we we didn't think we would be seeing in the in this time frame. Uh, to keep us on track, and I, I planted a seed with the the audiences joining us today that our third topic, the future ready state of support or future ready state of AMS, was really the value in today's call. So I want to get to it and I want to make sure we have plenty of time to cover off on that, which means that's going to come at the expense of our second topic. So Raj, I'm going to ask you to just take a take a break on this second topic and I'm going to come to Anu and Chuck and just ask you to briefly touch on how the, the pandemic and ha has affected how you view or slash value that partner relationship, how it has changed as, as a result of the way you looked at it back in January and February to the way you're looking at it now as we kick off September, as crazy as that sounds. So how has the, the business uh, the, and, and the partner relationship been uh, affected as a result of the pandemic? And Chuck Anu, whoever would like to go first, I'll, I'll come to you with that. So, yeah, I can I can jump in. I think you know even as we were going down the approach of defining our new strategy, defining our teams, we, we went through looking at AMS partners, and and one of our key principles was a partnership. Finding a, you know someone that we that would understand us as a company, work with us, and have that partnership with us. You know we we didn't look at cost as a main factor. We didn't look at location you know we really drove partnership and because of those partnerships you know that's what we leaned on in this as we needed the help we needed the resources we had that comfort level to say we can we can leverage our existing partner base we have that trust with them we can bring 
people on as needed faster or scale back as faster and, and use that as a as an advantage so that we can keep at that pace that we we were we had to do in some ways like i said earlier an accelerated pace new projects and not and as we move forward in, in the future that's still the key component for us uh, you know the value of my team is is not just support my team you know is is that partnership with the business having that seat at the table defining technology that's going to change the business move it forward and grow it and you know that ams piece and the resources and the vendors that we deal with that's that's our main criteria you know it, even more so now because it's harder to go off and bring all these new companies in and try to do this revert virtually and and then get a feel for who can really deliver so that's the thing that and, you know, like Dave, Dave jumped in with what Raj said there, that, that knowledge transfer just becomes critically important and it's even more exposed during during a business disruption of the magnitude of this. Anu, what, what were you getting ready to, to share from, from your vantage point? Yeah, so from my vantage point, traditionally our AMS models, like before the pandemic, were largely focused on uh, keeping the lights on, on staffing, right? Yeah. Um, but in response to the changing scenario, um, it's it's completely changed. So we 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 were looking and we have that AMS partnership um, in, in in Yash as well as other partners. Uh, they need to stay lockstep um, in lockstep with us to remain agile, to remain lean, and to remain flexible. So we are making these short tactical maneuvers in response to the situation. But more than anything, uh, how the relationship has changed is AMS, our AMS partners have changed from a largely keeping the lights on staffing a provider uh, from a purely tactical to strategic stakeholders. And this is something that we would have expected to happen uh, five years, 10 years down the road, as uh, Raj said. But what has changed significantly is our AMS resources are now strategic stakeholders in our strategic initiatives. Um, so we are looking to um, not for uh, not just staff up or, uh, up or down, which we always used to do, but now they're providing turnkey solutions. Uh, like for example, we had a, uh, we didn't want to drop the ball in our strategic initiatives, especially regarding business acquisition or growth. Um, so we could just like, you know, make the phone call and say, hey, we want a turnkey solution we're going to consolidate um, legal entities in um, in, in Asia, mm. and we want like AMS type resources. Give us the turnkey um, turnkey um, solution. You become a partner in road mapping with us, in in, in creating strategic plans for us, yeah. um, in implementation. So that's the biggest uh, change that we've seen, and we've been um, uh, busier than ever before, um, especially um, not just uh, in the enhancements area but in projects area we do not want to drop the ball there in the projects area so we've really been able to leverage um the ams partner in that and the other thing that we're also looking um for the ams partner um to be from a, from a culture perspective is it, it is a stressful time people are like working being very productive so we do um we are not only working on our resource morale but we also expect ams partner to do the same and mitigate churn and mitigate attrition during these stressful times uh, because now they're a key stakeholder in our strategic initiative so um so we are we're absolutely looking to that john may i add a comment here please please yeah go ahead. I, I i um having been on both sides of this i was a managed service implementation manager for info service infosys and uh um, and obviously I've been a customer for many years, uh, but um, one of the things that I tried to, and I would encourage the AMS teams that are on the phone, don't, don't look at only stripping out cost and looking at uh, how much you can get for a fixed price. Look at your, look at it as a true partnership. Try to make it win-win and because that's the only way you can build that strategic partnership that Anu's talking about. Because basically, if you take the the Viking approach, sooner or later the uh, the uh, the relationship will break, 
And so what you want to do is develop long-term relationships. And that takes give and take on both sides and compromise and understanding. And I really think as you think about outsourcing AMS, moving to a shared service or a managed services model, you really have to look at it and, and, and appreciate that vendor as a true partner, not simply as a vendor. And so that's, I'm just backing up what Chuck and Anu have both said. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate that very much, Dave. And again, you, you, you've you offered you've offered a great segue in, into, into what we're going to cover off on on the last 15 minutes or, or so of today's webinar. And, and that really is the future ready state of AMS and the future ready state of, of your departments. When, when we when we listen to you discuss a lot of the things that have been going on over the last five or six months, it, it's readily apparent that what the view was on some support as a whole six months ago is vastly different than than where it is today. And, and you heard a new talking about how we, we now view our partners as as a strategic relationship that 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 we have to have. They, they absolutely have a seat at the table and are pushing other initiatives other than just keeping the, the lights on type of a thing. Chuck, when we were talking about this in preparation for today, you know, the, the, the thought track and the talk track came around, how, how do you roadmap the future state of, of AMS? And, and what's that picture looking like within your organization currently? And, and what do you, you see that road mapping exercise look like over, over the months to come to really evolve this whole notion of AMS so it becomes that, that next generation of, of AMS that, that is going to be coming to everybody's companies as a result is what, of what has been uncovered over these last few months. So uh, let, let's start, Chuck, with you, if you could cover off on how you're gonna roadmap it, and then we'll open that up to the rest of the team and really get a sense of the future ready state of support. Yeah, actually, yeah, it's an interesting one because I, I look at our road mapping world differently. We're not really road mapping it from an AMS perspective. We're really road mapping from a business perspective. That's where okay. we're working to really drive, you know, that those priorities within a business. If it's not driven by a business need with the right benefits, then it's something we yeah. probably shouldn't be doing. And, and that's where we're, our roadmap is is more important, I think. You know, my solution teams, as well as at AMS, is that one team approach really will support that roadmap moving forward. And, you know, to me, it's it's having that team, it's having that flexibility to be agile enough to change. You know, we, we, we have maybe a heavy focus on SAP right now, but as SAP settles, our resource shift could go towards other things, whether it's a data warehousing initiative, analytics, more around logistics. So to me, is we're, we're really our road mapping towards a business direction, business needs, and how um, how our, our one team, which includes AMS, can really adapt to that and position that, itself to support. That, that's really interesting. And we, we keep hearing agility and flexibility coming up. And, and that was going to be my, my final question to the group. And I'm, I'm just going to go at it because I can't, I can't resist it. I'm like a mouse around the cheese on a mousetrap. I, I, can't, I can't resist the topic anymore. Dave, you know, we, we, we talked about agility and flexibility and, and how important it's going to be for the future state of AMS. And I can see my friend Raj, he's just dying to, to jump in on this too, to talk about agility and flexibility. Uh, what's your vantage point on, on Dave, on, on what flexibility and agility are going to play for, for the near term, but even more so the long term with AMS? What's well, fascinating that Chuck said it's less about AMS and more about the business. I think uh, what, what we're trying to do is say, okay, what from a philosophical point of view and an organizational point of view, how does IT need to be set up? so that we're agile and flexible, responsive and adaptable. And so uh, I'll just put a plug out for an article I posted on LinkedIn, Structural Agility by Jardena London. Um, that is a great article. Um, and I would tell you that uh, we're, we're using some of the concepts there. Also, Cicel Pear, uh, Turkish lady. I uh, look up some of her work on human-centered leadership uh, and, what we're doing is saying, okay, you've got to have an organizational structure, but how do you become uh, flexible and agile? And so what we've done is by our IT director on one side, we've set up a strategic group 
and some of the management team from IT sits in that group. They're planning the future. They're looking at data analytics. They're looking at long-term projects. They're looking at ERP changes down the road. And then there's uh, what we call the outsourced group, and there's basically one tactical manager facing that. So essentially all three of the managers, four of the managers roll up to uh, the IT director, if you will, but uh, what we've really done is said that structure is meaningless. What's really meaningful is what's happening in the strategic group and how we're managing this tactical outsourced group. And so we're looking at it and saying that gives us the flexibility to actually uh, move the pieces around because the people that need to know are, are part of what's happening all the time. So that's really what we're trying to do. And it and that trails right into the whole AMS piece. If 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 the leadership and the team knows what's going on, then they're more agile. Got it. Dave, thank yeah, you very much. I, yeah, I, I appreciate I agree. it. I appreciate I appreciate it's in the, the on note on the, the LinkedIn article too. Fred, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. Uh, and and I I love that answer, Dave. Um, and that you know a little bit goes back to what I said earlier about you know I I personally feel like the agility and the flexibility and all those things that IT needs to have if we're in close contact and in, and embedded with the, the business organization and we know what's important to them and we know when it's important to them yep we're able to respond almost at the same time they're able to respond, right? We're not finding out about it exactly. a week before they need it. We find out about it yep. and learn about it when they do. So our flexibility and agility needs to match theirs. Um, yes. But it, but it forces us and we have to be part of the business, right? Because we can't just be off in a, in, a, in a black hole playing with fun toys, right? We have to be part of the business. It has to be, so what, right? I mean, why are we here? Um, and you're right. It's it's all about the value of the business. And you know, from an AMS standpoint, I think AMS plays a big part of that, right? Um, Agreed. But they're, at least from my perspective, they're just representative of the IT organization, right? We've chosen to take that piece of the IT organization and make it a third party. Um, but when I'm out talking into the in speaking with the business or with my colleagues. Um, you know that's part of my organization yes. right um so it, it from that standpoint it's uh, i used to work for uh the cio at Dell Hayes america back in you know five six years ago she was famous for saying we all wear the same jersey right um and i that that it's it was kind of cliche but it's very true i think it's, and then you it's go to the same be, functions at, you yeah. you you share life as it were inside yeah, of the company yeah yeah, yeah. I, I really feel like, and it's the it's the, it's the strength of a good IT organization, is and you never get there, right? But you got to understand yes. the business as well as the business does. It's interesting, Fred, that you share how important it is to collaborate and work together with from IT and the business. Now that we're we've been forced to be separated into our home offices, it's really shined a light on how important yeah. collaboration is, and and uh, that's one of the things that. If you can find silver linings in the clouds of all of this, right. to me, that's one of the biggest silver linings is we now know how important collaboration amongst the, the different parts of, of the businesses, whether it's IT and, and the general business as a whole, as, as you were just alluding to, Fred, that, that, that's going to be critically important as we, we start to evolve out of, of what we've been dealing with, with the business disruption. I do, I got to get to Raj with, with his closing comments, but I, I do, if there, if you have something that you would like to share from your perspective, from an agility or a flexibility standpoint, I want to make sure you can get in your last thoughts there around those. And then Raj will immediately come to you and you can give your, your parting thoughts and tie up the, the webinar as a whole. Anu? Yeah, I would say don't hesitate to think uh, out of the box. Like the, our roadmap, roadmap in response to the pandemic has evolved into a parallel track. So there's your traditional five-year roadmap with the strategic initiatives, but it's absolutely imperative, and this comes from the top-down leadership in our company, that we also have this parallel roadmap uh, delivering uh, our tactical quick win solutions that we use the AMS exclusively for uh, like we have a we have we have a monthly product release and we say like oh this is version one this is what we release in version one this is version two so that plays into the agility and that has uh, become a part of the roadmap now and it's almost like a parallel parallel track. Cool. Appreciate that, Anu. That that's great insights and 
And as I transition to Raj, we're not going to have time for the, the formal uh, wind down and, and closing comments. So as I, I go to Raj, heartfelt thank you to all of our panelists today. The, the thought leadership that, that you have lent has, has far exceeded expectations. And my expectations were really high based on our preparation. But, but you, you, all of you delivered at, at, a, at an extremely impressive level today. So, so thank you all. Raj, I'm going to transition over to you, my friend, for, for your thoughts on on, on Yash specifically around this notion of agility and flexibility and, and where Yash is going with the next generation of AMS. Right, John. And I think I have to concur with a lot of the thoughts that have come from the panel. Um, Dave, Jack and Fred and Anu, they, whatever they're saying around the, the agility, flexibility, we notice that as an industry from process centric, we see the industry moving towards flexibility and fungibility, right? And then we also see there is use of intelligence augmentation that is kind of baked into the overall AMS roadmap. In general, that is expected to bring in efficiencies. Similarly, it's all automation. That's, that's the buzzword right now. But beyond automation, we also see that people are looking at applications that are autonomous and self-aware, right? That's, that's the trend. I mean, I'm talking about, I know we, we are looking at automation. We are looking at bringing an intelligence into things, but things are going a little beyond that if you really look at the industry trend. And finally, like Chuck and Dave are saying, it's more, it's less of aim as more of business, right? So you can see that shift from service level agreements to business level agreements. And beyond that, you see experience level agreements. That's the trend in the industry today. And experience level agreements come with, like somebody called out, it's a combination of business outcome and value. Right. If you are looking at certain systems being down for a certain time, now today in an SLA scenario, we look at within how many hours or minutes I recovered the system. But the XLAs are going to look at how the user felt about it and what's the impact of that downtime on the business. That's the stage where the industry is headed towards. Right. So those being the trends, right? I know Dave is also excited to probably add on. Dave, do you want to add on something quickly? Okay. So so with, with those being the trends, right? We at Yash, we have a transformation led AMS approach from day one where we look at, you know, there is this knowledge transfer like we discussed earlier. We come in, we kind of understand the portfolio. We look at application inventory, but on the same day, we also look at low hanging opportunities that we can make as recommendations back to our customers in terms of transformation opportunities or automation opportunities or things that can probably improve or be replaced with a product. Similarly, we are investing our time and energies into building a bot libraries that could give our customers a bunch of ideas. If not adopt them directly, at least that kind of, you know, provokes certain thought process in terms of, hey, these are all the ideas that we can use to automate our business processes or even basic IT operations, right? Similarly, we have this process of, you know, application portfolio rationalization, which we call as our proprietary framework called DART, digitization through application rationalization and transformation. A lot of times we notice, like Anu was saying, you know, you can have a five-year roadmap. You look at initial exercise of optimizing or rationalizing your application portfolio. But why don't you do that on a continuous basis? If you do that, there is a continuous benefit that you can derive from doing such exercise in terms of minimizing your application landscape while you deliver the desired business value to your customers, right? So that's in constant focus. Similarly, wherever possible, do we have an opportunity to change a particular SLA into a near business SLA, if not an experience level agreement? Can we work with our customers to kind of build a near business SLA? That's been, you know, in, in the roadmap that we are building for our customers. And finally, obviously a laser focused approach on delivering year on year cost savings through various improvements. But at the end of it, this can all be achieved only when you have a matured customer and a passionate service provider joining hands, like Dave was calling out earlier, right? It, it really needs maturity on both ends, not just service provider trying to you know, try something on and then customer doesn't take it in the right context. So it doesn't happen. Finally, I would conclude this with by saying, I think what's important in today's context is cultivating customer obsessed teams who are kind of engaged, managed by capable leadership. Again, like, like I think Fred was calling out and then use these collaboration platforms like the one that we are talking today 
and i think these are the three key things that will differentiating the you now differentiate positioning for service providers like us to kind of create outstanding employee and customer experience so with that i kind of conclude my opinion on this raj your your timing is impeccable because we've come to the top of the hour which is the the end of our webinar with that we can get fred back to vacation raj you can get some sleep please go to sleep everybody else on the panel thank you very much for your time and our our visitors out there in the virtual world appreciate you joining us for an hour today look forward to continued conversations and again be safe everyone we'll talk soon have a great rest of your day Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, thank thanks, you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Very nice talking to you. Thank you.